You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. This episode is brought to you by Hyperice, the leader in advanced warm-up and recovery technology. They have tons of innovative products, like Venom heated wearables to help soothe sore back muscles, Normatec compression boots to speed up recovery and increase circulation, and Hypervolt massage guns to improve mobility. Loved by athletes like Naomi Osaka and Erling Holland. Try them yourself. Get 10% off your order with the code MOVE at hyperrice.com. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packer Net Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore that am. Well, happy Saturday morning. We made it to the weekend. It's actually Saturday morning for me, so I'm very, very happy. I'm, I'm tired, but my brain is fresh, and I got my, my drink that I can't talk about because they're not sponsoring me. I should reach out to them and be like, hey, man. I can't shut up about you guys. Just just pay me a little bit of money so I can just talk about it freely. Because I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to forget and just not care. That's why I com- I'm completely honest. I'm very happy with the sponsors I have right now with Prediction Strike and DraftKings because I legitimately am using both of them. <laughs> I, I just like, it's like I just re-recorded the Prediction Strike thing and I have a hard time keeping it like at a minute. It's like, ugh, I got I to gotta stop talking here. But it's, I mean, you know that I'm not lying when I say I like Prediction Strike because I literally created this exact game and we did it on a spreadsheet and we we did this for fun together. Jeez, I should have sold Tevin Coleman when I had the chance. <laughs> is, she is a tankin'. That's all right. I mean, he's going to have a big game sometime and I'll just get rid of him. A.J. Dillon needs to do something. I'm not too worried about it. He's going to have a game sometime this year. MVS obviously is tanking. Um I might sell Sammy Watkins here because I don't really expect him to do much. He didn't gain very much, but I'm still making money right now. What's his projections? 51 yards, 0.3 touch. I mean, that's the thing. Like, with all these guys, they're going to have a game. Like, he's going to have a 100-yard game at some point. Just wait for it and then cash out, I guess. That's the one thing I don't get about predictions. for How are they going to make money? Because I can do that with everybody. I'll wait for that one game where they smash through their projections, sell, and then I make money. So I don't I don't get it. I don't know. Not my problem. Maybe that's why every time one of these companies starts up, they go out of business. Hopefully, Predictions Right doesn't, though. Anyways, um, the vast majority of the day today needs to be dedicated to looking at the 49ers, because we haven't really done that yet. Um, obviously, we still have tomorrow as well to look at it. I still haven't quite gotten into the groove of how I want to do it. What I used to do was, today is like, I would do like... Th- four days of looking at the team. Um, but part of it is kind of looking back toward the season, and we don't have a lot of season. So I haven't really started doing that. And then there's looking at the team, and then there's looking at the matchup, and then Sunday or whatever day the game is was just kind of like a rah-rah day. Like, we got this, woo! And I'm just, I don't know, haven't really got into that so much. Probably should, it's fun. But, you know, people take it seriously, and then we lose, and people throw that whole episode in your face as though it wasn't just like a hype session. Just annoying. Oh, I thought that one time, because I only listened to one episode ever, that you said we were going to win. Anyways, um, there's also a little college ball today. It's probably going to be a long episode. Um, what I think I'll do, we'll start with the 49ers, because I, you know, if that takes an hour, we'll just skip all the college stuff. Plus, I don't want to start with that, and people are like, I'm not listening to this garbage, and then go listen to somebody else. Although it's Saturday, good luck finding a podcast on a Saturday. I've tried. Nobody cares about you on Saturday except me. I'm the only one that loves you. Go find a Packers podcast outside of Pack a Day because they're obligated by their title. You can't. I don't have to. I do it because I love you and I want money. <laughs> and also, I mean, we got a lot to talk about, man. I don't know how you can do one a week. What do you talk about for one time a week? I've done six episodes this past week and I still can't get it under an hour. But that'll be the plan. Then we'll talk about a little tiny, incy bit of college football, just kind of because I want to do a little catcher-upper, right? It's mostly for the draft folks. I want to look at mostly prospects, guys that you can keep an eye out for today, um, some names to be aware of, that kind of thing. And I swear, Ole Miss never, ever plays at a normal time. Every time I'm like, ooh, do they got like an 11 o'clock game? Are they going to be playing at noon today? Where are they? I can't find them. Oh man, they don't play this week? Need to rest after that 61-21 shellacking of Tulane? 
<laughs> oh, I tried to tell you. Try to tell you about that Matty Corral. Currently graded as the seventh highest um, quarterback, by the way. But we're not talking about college football right now. And if that sounds low, it's not. This isn't the NFL. You've got like uh, Bailey Zep- Zappy, West Kentucky, who's higher. You know what I mean? You got that kind of stuff. Malik Willis is the only guy above him that's considered a first-round prospect, just uh, for record. And he plays for Liberty and plays against high school girls. And he has a 79 passing grade, which is the most important part. So Matt Corral is the best quarterback in college football. Anyways, let's talk about the 49ers. So again, I know there's only been um, two games, but I want to look at these two games as of right now. And they play the Detroit Lions and the Philadelphia Eagles. These are two teams that are not expected to be playoff teams. These are two teams that are probably expected to be drafting in the top 10, if not the top five. After that, they have the eighth ranked offense and the 10th ranked defense. So again, um, all the hype about the 49ers, and I'm not saying they're bad, and I'm certainly not saying we're going to beat them, but it's, you know, it's underwhelming. And they're, uh, you know, again, Detroit nearly came back and won the game. They scored 33 points against the 49ers. And um, on the other game, the defense did a great job and held Philadelphia to only 11 points, but their offense only scored 17. So this this actually reminds me a lot of the like 2019 Packers or or other different Packer teams where we would win in different ways. 2019 actually makes a lot of sense because we had a, a an offense that was sporadically competent and a defense that was sporadically competent. Some days the defense would win it for us, some days the offense would win it for us, but at the end of the day there were a lot of games you just didn't feel super great about. And I think for the 49ers, although 49ers fans are not Packer fans, so they're probably just excited and think they're going to win the Super Bowl, uh, whereas Packer fans would look at both of these games and say, we suck, we're never going to win anything, we're the worst team in football, because that's how Packer fans operate. We're constantly in a state of winning and not being happy. So <laughs> that's just, that's Packer fandom for you. Interestingly enough, and this is this is a good bit of news, and, and, and I don't necessarily expect it to hold up, Because again, they have a pretty good defensive front and linebacker and et cetera, et cetera. But as of right now, they have the 28th ranked rushing defense. The Detroit Lions ran for 116 yards. So while again, garbage time. No, 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 no. You don't run in garbage time. That's the whole point. That's the whole thing. Once garbage time hits, you start throwing nonstop. So we're talking about like a half a game. They they ran for 116 yards. And then Philadelphia comes around the corner and runs for 151 yards. So we could at least start there and say this. The Packers have to run the ball well, and I expect them to run the ball well. I understand we have two injuries on the offensive line. It doesn't matter. There is no excuse. We cannot win this game if we don't win up front, and we've seen that consistently. We lost to the Saints. We ran for 43 yards in that game. The other games we lost last year, Tampa Bay Buccaneers, defensive front destroyed our offensive front in both Buccaneers games. Right, with the the 49ers, it was the same thing with that defensive front just absolutely destroying us. Um, Same thing with the Eagles and the Chargers. In 2019, we lost four games. All four of them were because our our offensive line couldn't hold up for the most part, right? Uh, uh, Nick Bosa for the Chargers just destroyed um, David Bakhtiari, just killed him. And and same with uh, Nick. So Nick and Joey for the 49ers, two 49ers games and Chargers game, um, we lost three out of our four games because of a Bosa, more or less. And then for the Eagles, it really just wasn't too much different. It was our, we couldn't stop them from running the ball at all. Um, actually, that's not, oh yeah, 100 and, uh, what is it, 160 yards they ran for? Oh no, they passed, <laughs> passed for 160. They ran for 176. We could not stop them from running the ball. By the way, all four of those losses, the Eagles ran for 176, the Chargers ran for 160, the 49ers ran for 112 in one of the games, um, and then 285 in the other game. So the, the, the point is, we know how this works. We have to win up. We have to win the trenches. That's it. And if we can't, we lose. That's the bottom line. And that's, that's the whole thing with this game. And I've said this now numerous times. The whole thing with this game is it's not about the roster. And we can go through the roster, and I can show you how we have a better one than they do, and it's true. But the problem is our head coach, offensive coordinator, defensive coordinator have not found a way to um, exploit their weaknesses and our strengths. The the simple fact of the matter is if, if a team has a better defensive line, they beat us, and that's it. And I don't know why this doesn't happen for other teams. Why, why if it's so simple to just say, well, if we can stop you from running the ball up front 
and just play cover two, then there's nothing you can do. I, I don't know, man. I get that it makes it harder. Just like when you stack the box, it makes it harder to run, but it's not impossible to run. You can still do it. It's, it does happen. I've seen it happen. You just have to win. That's where guys like Devontae Adams should shine. That's where guys like Tunyon, who's supposedly a freak, should shine. That's where guys like MVS with his speed should shine. That's where guys like Aaron Rodgers, who are freakish football players, should shine and make very difficult throws. Also, this is supposed to be a team that prides itself on running the ball. If a team says, we're not going to try to stop you from running the ball, aside from just running our, our, our basic front, we should be able to tear them up because it's a simple numbers game. It's 11 on 11. We're just bringing four. Well, we got five and maybe six with a tight end. And I know you got linebackers, but we should be able to push them out of the way enough to get three, four yards. We just, we just have to be better than that. And there just isn't an excuse. And I know it's super scary because they're a good defensive line. There's a lot of good defensive lines. So what? They just have to show up and they just have, and, and we've seen them do it. That's the other thing. It's, it's the fact that you need everybody to do it consistently. If one guy fails, it blows the whole thing up. And we don't have an entire offensive line that fails. We just don't have, have five guys that can do it consistently on every down. So, you know, if John Runyon does it seven out of 10 times, and Josh Myers does it, you know, eight out of 10 times, and Lucas Patrick does it six out of 10 times, and Billy Turner does it six out of 10 times, you know, you get to a situation where the odds that nobody's going to fail is almost zero. If you just randomize it, somebody's going to mess up on this play. Somebody's going to lose on this play. And then you just have to make sure that the guy that lost doesn't completely ruin it for the whole play. Like he's, you know, it's the left tackle and we're running right. So it hopefully doesn't matter as much. We need five guys to execute. And by the way, we need the running back to execute as well. Because just like a quarterback starts to not trust his offensive line and pass blocking, you might find a running back not trusted. You know, there, there's a lot of anticipation with running the ball. I'm supposed to run through there, and I expect that there should be a hole opening there. And I trust my guys to to create one. And if you don't, it's like, well, I'm not going to just trust it's there. I'm going to bounce it to the outside. And that's when linebackers chase you and bring you down. So you need all the offensive linemen and the running back to be on point. Otherwise, it's not going to work. But again, they've been run against consistently. And it really comes down to passing the ball, again, at least in these last two games. They're sixth on offense in passing, ninth in passing defense, which again is surprising, but I think it comes down to the simple fact of pass rush, because their corners are not necessarily dominant, elite, whatever. By the way, in terms of overall, just via PFF, the Packers are ranked 12th, the 49ers are ranked 13th. That's after the 49ers going 2-0 and and the Packers getting shellacked by the Saints in week one. Still, they're looking at the Packers and saying that they're a better team. Defensively, the, the 49ers, even with Bosa and Armstead and all these guys, their defense ranks 62nd, ours is ranked 68th. I'm just saying, again, I, I, I fully understand if they win, how they win. We don't show up. We don't play well. They annihilate our offensive line. We can't run the ball. Aaron Rodgers is under the duress. He panics. He can't find anybody open. And it just devolves into utter chaos. And then they run the ball. We can't stop the run. And it's just an embarrassment. I get that. But that shouldn't happen. Matt LaFleur needs to look at this team and say, here are the areas. And there's a lot of them where we're a lot better than you. And we're going to use those things to make your life difficult. That is his job. And, and, and again, we win most of the time. So most of the time he does a great job of that. But, but this is the one area where it becomes a serious problem. And even when you even have a game like the Saints, where they don't have defensive tackles at all, they're not good football players. We couldn't push them out of the way to run the ball. They had like two good pass rushers on the edge, no corners, no defensive tackles. One out of their three linebackers was pretty good. And the safeties are mediocre at best. And we could not Use that to our advantage, and that sucks. You should not be a team that has like one really good edge rusher and you can beat the Packers because that's all it takes. That's what the Chargers did. Chargers defense wasn't very, I mean, they got a couple corners, but again, it was just Nick Bosa. That's it. Nick destroyed our offensive line, got a ton of pressure, put Aaron Rodgers in panic mode, and we lost. And that's it. That's the whole story. We're infinitely better than the Chargers were in 2019. Doesn't matter. That's not good enough, man. But let's uh, very quickly run through uh, their offense here, just to kind of give you an idea of what's been going on. Um, Starting with the quarterback, Jimmy Garoppolo has been the main guy. Uh, Trey Lance has only played four snaps this entire season. Now, somebody did ask me a question. 
I saw it just when I woke up this morning. Who was that really quickly here? Mark sent me a message on Facebook. He says, um, I'm wondering what your thoughts are regarding the possibility of the 49ers starting Trey Lance since Jimmy G has been less than stunning. I have a feeling Trey, being more mobile and extremely quick, could completely destroy our defense, especially if we cannot put any pressure on him. A common problem in both the first two games. Uh, could he be the stinger that catches the pack completely off guard? My first thought was no, because Trey Lance is the lowest graded offensive player on this team. There have not been a lot of very good reports about Trey Lance. However, I absolutely could see that being a thing. Not that they start Trey Lance, but that they use Trey Lance. And why not? Trey Lance is just a secret weapon, and it wouldn't hurt to just bring him out. By the way, of his four snaps, three times he ran. But, but here's the thing. He only ran against Detroit. Three snaps, three attempts, two yards. So it didn't work very well. Here's the thing, though. They understand what the Packers are. They understand that the Packers struggle against the run. They understand that they struggle with linebackers. And so that's the kind of area where you bring in Trey Lance. And even though we know that the guy's just going to come out and run, you know, he's just going to take a direct snap and take off, can we stop it? What would it hurt to bring him out? And if he runs for 37 yards, just kind of do it again once in a while. I guess what I'm saying is I would be kind of surprised if we don't see him at all. Now, if the 49ers just come out and they're going to come out with Jimmy Garoppolo, if they come out and they're able to run the ball and pass the ball at ease, there's no need to bring out Trey Lance and try this trickery nonsense. You're just giving the Packers an opportunity to to get a win. Because if they, you know, if you bring him out and he gets stuffed, then now it's second and 10 and you're kind of setting yourself behind. And why? You're dominating. But if it's kind of a tight game, you could see where they're like, let's just see what happens. I'm just curious. And again, if, if this turns into a, a, you know, Michael Vick situation, a McNabb situation, a Kaepernick situation, or any mobile quarterback that's ever played the Packers and had a lot of success, which by the way, to the Packers credit, that did get nipped in the butt a little bit. Dom Capers committed himself to stopping that and they did do a better job. Everything else fell apart. That's when we kind of went from pass rush to containment, but they did get a little better at it. I know like Russell Wilson kind of uh, wasn't able to do very much after a while. But again, with that said, I wouldn't put it at the forefront of your mind that that they've got this elite quarterback that was drafted very early with with blazing speed, and um, he should be our biggest concern. It's possible they use him as a secret weapon, and it's possible that it's effective, but so far, again, he's the lowest graded player on their entire offense. They brought him out a couple times to run the ball. He had zero success, and that was against the Lions, who were, you know, not a very good football team. Looking at Jimmy G, um... 67 overall grade. It's, you know, pretty standard Jimmy G. I know the, the whole thing is, well, when he's out there, it's pretty... No, he's he's an average quarterback. In 2019, he had a 70 overall grade. Um, you know, in, in 2017 with San Francisco, when he first got there, it was nearly a 90. But otherwise, it's just not been very good. Granted, he's been hurt most of the time. That 2019 was the only time he had a full season. So whatever. But again, I can't give you credit for something when you've done it once ever. And it was a 70-something, you know... It's been two weeks, and he hasn't done very well. But um, week one against Detroit, 17 of 25, which is 68%, not super special. 314 yards is a lot, but 12.6 yards per attempt and one touchdown. Um, And then against Philadelphia, 22 of 30, 73%, but only 189 yards and one touchdown. So completely different style of game. The first one was aired out against Detroit. The second one was dink and dunk against Philly. They got the job done. Again, this is a situation where you look at a San Francisco 49ers team that attacks two different teams in two different ways and has success either way. Looking at their offensive line, well, I guess we should before we get there, we should talk about something that's somewhat important here. Jimmy Garoppolo, when kept clean versus being under pressure. And again, this this generally is the case for everybody, but it's not for everybody. I did I forgot who it was I looked at, but there was somebody um, that it Basically, their grade so far has been better while under pressure. And Tom Brady generally does good with under pressure and certain guys. Oh, Dak. Dak is incredible under pressure. But once again, for the third week in a row, we've got a guy that is just night and day different when kept clean and under pressure. While kept clean, 82 overall grade, under pressure, 28. He is 34 of 45 for 383 yards and a touchdown while kept clean. Under pressure, he is 5 of 10 for 120 yards and one touchdown. He does not have a single big time throw in the entire season. But he has two turnover-worthy plays, which is 14.3%, um, which is extremely high. And so, again, the the fact that he has zero inter- one touchdown, zero interceptions is misleading because there were two plays that easily could have been picked off. But um, actually, really, really quickly, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. 
Shout out to Jake, who's helping me out a little bit with some of my news and notes. By the way, Jake is very busy. If anybody else wants to help out, feel free. But final injury report for the Packers game. Before we kind of go through and look at all the pieces, we should see if they're potentially going to not play. Um, first of all, for the Green Bay Packers, um, Elton Jenkins, I know, was downgraded to doubtful, which is terrible. Very unlikely he plays. Dominique Daphne is questionable. Otherwise, it looks like we're pretty full on ready to go. Everybody else that's on the uh, report was full participation. They're not even, there's no Friday status. Um, so DeGuara looks like he's going to be playing, which is great. Rashawn Gary, ready to go. He's been uh, full participation all week. Uh, Tyler Lancaster um, was limited the first two days as full participation. I know you don't care, but um, he's he's back. Mercedes Lewis is always just veteran rest. Um, Josh Myers had a finger injury, but he's been full all week. Savage has been full all week. Vernon was limited, but full on Friday. Stokes limited with a quad injury, full on Friday, and Chandon full. So everybody's it's it's pretty solid to see that many people um, still healthy. I know it really sucks with Elton Jenkins, but it is what it is. For the 49ers, though, a very injury-ridden team every single year, and this is where it's like, well, you know, it, those other years didn't count because they were injured four out of the last five years. Well, first of all, that that matters, right? You shouldn't be injured that much, but they're already seeing a flurry of injuries again. Uh, Trent Williams, who we're just about to start talking about, Fred Warner, Jimmy Ward, all getting some veteran rust. They're trying to keep these guys healthy. Uh, Trey Sermon, who is injured with a concussion, looks like he's going to be playing. Uh, Josh Norman, ankle injury is fine. Emmanuel Mosley, the cornerback, is questionable. Elijah Mitchell, the running back, is doubtful to play. Javon Kinlaw, defensive tackle, is questionable. Eric Armstead is questionable, which is, uh, again, Javon Kinlaw and Eric Armstead are extremely important guys to pay attention to. But also, Jamichael Hasty, the running back, is out. There's another running back. And then Kevin Givens is also out. So they've got two guys out, one guy doubtful, and three questionables going into this game. But anyways, getting back to what we're talking about, the uh, left tackle, Trent Williams, I think is the highest graded tackle in football right now, which obviously sucks very, very much. Most of that is run blocking, 92.1 run blocking, which doesn't shouldn't provide us too much more comfort. As far as pass blocking, it's uh, 79.7, but he's given up zero sacks, zero hits, one hurry on the season so far. He's a, he's a We know he's a good football player. That's, that's a given. Um, left guard, Lakin Tomlinson. Um, basically he's a terrible pass blocker. Um, he's only given up one hit, but he has a 64 overall pass blocking grade and 80 run blocking grade. So again, it's the 49ers. They push people out of the way. Um, but the point is we should be, again, if we look at just pass blocking, just real quick, um, they don't have anybody above Trent Williams and that's a 79, right? So it's just, it's not all that fantastic. And the only, the next best, um, Offensive lineman is Daniel Brunskill, who I've never even heard of, and that's a 69 overall grade. That's pass blocking. We should be able to get some pressure. Um, But anyways, looking at center, Alex Mack, he's for some reason been really terrible. Um, 62 overall grade, 60 run blocking, 66 pass blocking. Again, giving up almost no sacks, hits, or hurries. In fact, on the entire season, only one sack, three hits, and eight hurries. They've had 12 pressures all year. We had that basically in week one. So um, I don't know if that's getting the ball out of your hand quickly or whatever the case may be, but they're doing a great job of mitigating the issues with the offensive line. Now, there's a couple different things. The first thing that comes to mind is the Packers need to work on that, right? Even if guys are failing, which you would expect when you have two of your best offensive linemen out. And and with that, you generally what? You lean on the run, you get the ball out quickly, you uh, use the screen game effectively to kind of back off the pack r- pass rush. You do those kinds of things. The Packers need to do that. But again, it comes down to you need to be able to execute those things. The other side of it, though, is the defense needs to know that. If this offensive line really isn't that great of pass blockers, they're just utilizing certain things to kind of mitigate the... Well, that's fine, but then you use your defense a certain kind of way. Because they're tearing a bunch of stuff out of their playbook if that's the case. In other words, it's almost as if we want to do the opposite of what everybody does to us. If we're just going to play two shell and we're just going to kind of play off and we're going to just dare them to run the ball and and come with our base package, we're going to get destroyed. That's what the 49ers love. Dink and dunk, run the ball, basically no pressure on the quarterback. They're in heaven with that kind of stuff. If it's me, and again, they did it fairly effectively against the the Detroit Lions, so you got to be a little bit careful. But if it's me, I'm loading up the box and I'm bringing tons of pressure 
and we're just going to be attacking downhill. And I'm going to trust our corners and our safeties to not allow the big plays. But I'm going to kind of leave them on an island and trust them to do what they have to do. Stokes and Jair and Savage and Amos. That's that's my thought. And again, it's 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 a high risk thing because if they're able to have success, it's going to be down the field. But force Jimmy G to be that guy. Force him to get a, get him into a shootout situation and, and force these passes with very little time to complete the passes. Yeah, he completed a 20-yard pass, but he's got to do it consistently. And if one of those is a pick, if one of these is a sack, just keep it coming. Keep you know, I mean, I want him to start hearing footsteps because you know they're going to do that to Rodgers, and we know he's not a very good quarterback in those types of situations. Yeah, it's not fun, but you know what? Too bad. It's still going to be hard to run the ball when we got, you know, eight guys crowding around the defensive line. And that doesn't mean they're all coming necessarily, but it's still, it's going to be hard to, to do that. And if you're trying to run screens and we don't bring the linebackers, they're going to be ready for it. And in general, I think as fans, we would accept it more. Maybe not. I mean, none of us like to see the, the 20, 30 yard passes. We're all going to be upset about it, but we just want to see some aggression. We want to see some people flying around. We want to see some attacking. We're so tired of watching our defense just stand there and get picked on. If you're going to lose, go down swinging. That's all I ask, right? It's the same philosophy we have with Stokes. Maybe he's bad, but we know King is. So if we're going to lose, let's lose trying to, to win big rather than just watching the team die slowly. I don't, I don't get that. Anyways, at right guard, they got Daniel Brunskill. Um, again, 72 overall, but he's got a 69 run blocking, 69 pass blocking, so he's mediocre in those areas. Again, this is not... You know, this is not like the 2018 Cowboys or whatever year that was with this elite dominant um, offensive line with, with Ezekiel Elliott running behind him. This is not the Tennessee Titans with a dominant offensive line and uh, Derrick Henry running behind it. This is the 49ers with like two good offensive linemen and a hodgepodge of running backs. I know they do a good job regardless, but I, I'm, I'm saying the Packers need to do that. The Packers need to be a team that say, oh, look, we're better than them. Rashawn Gary and Preston Smith and Kenny Clark are good football players, and their offensive line are mediocre football players, and their running backs are like undrafted free agents. We need to win. Well, it's the 49ers, and they're just good at stuff. No, no, no. Bull. They're just football players. These are football players that nobody's heard of, that nobody wanted. This is not 2019. As much as everybody wants to make it 2019, it's not. 2019, they had Joe Staley. Where's, where's Joe Staley at? It was, it was Joe Staley, Lakin Tomlinson, Weston Richburg, uh, Mike Person, and Mike McGlinchey. Right now, the only ones that are still there are Lakin Tomlinson and Mike McGlinchey. Those other guys are gone. Brunskill was a backup in 2019. It's a different group. Different group. I don't want the same excuses. Come up with some new excuses. And then again, you got right tackle Mike McGlinchey, historically a very, very good football player, but he is their, literally their worst offensive lineman right now. Um, I don't know exactly what his problem is, but 58 run blocking grade, 62 pass blocking grade. Um, he's off to a pretty terrible start. Um, and to be completely honest, he's never actually... So I, I liked Mike McGlinchey, and I liked their picking of him in, in 2018. And he got off to a seemingly good start, 74 overall grade, 81 run blocking. His pass blocking has always been suspect, and I expected that to get better. Here are his grades over four years pass blocking, 64, 67, 58, 62. He's never been any good at it. He's a pure run blocker, which again, it's the 49ers, they like that, but you got to be able to pass block a little bit. 81, 74, 91 are his run blocking grades. He's got a 58 right now. So he's just kind of doing bad. So again, they've got Trent Williams on the left side. Other than that, it's a lot of, you know, some guys can run block. Otherwise, it's just, eh. That's not, listen, I'm not accepting any excuses about, well, we can't stop the run. Baloney, nonsense, hogwash. What other kind of mystical nonsense words can we use? And I, you know, I don't know. I I think like with everything, it's not a matter of are they good enough. It's just a matter of are they going to, are they going to perform? You know, I mean, I could sit here and I can go through our roster again. I can show you all the talent and I can show you what the stats are and I can show you what the grades are and I can say, look, they're doing pretty good. And I can talk about Savage and Amos and Jair and Stokes and, and Kenny and Preston. None of it's going to matter. All right, we can get all excited about how good Savage is. Except when Savage is the one that has to make a tackle 30 yards down the field on a running back. Then all of a sudden it's not as exciting to talk about Darnell Savage. Just got to play, man. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't know. I don't know what to say anymore. They should win. And me, like most people, I feel like they probably won't. <laughs> it does take a little bit of the pressure off. And I'm not super doom and gloom as though, like, they can't win. Of course they can. They have a better football team. They should win. 
But they're, you know, what, what, last I saw was minus three. Where are they at right now? Got to get my bets in, by the way. Speaking of bets, since I'm all over the place anyways, uh, patreon.com forward slash pack underscore daddy. If you support the podcast, I'm doing my uh, prop bets. Basically, I set up like five different unlikely scenarios. You get to pick one. And if that one hits, then I'm going to pick somebody to win a prize. I don't know what that prize is. It might be the DeGuara jersey. I'm not sure how Pristine feels about that. Not even sure how I feel about it, to be honest. And yes, you're going to have to sign up at Pristine. So if you're doing that, you might as well just sign up. Use promo code Packernet, please. Or it might just be something else. I don't know. We'll see how this goes. Because there's there's also a chance that nobody wins. Because these are all, again, unlikely scenarios. I tried to do a bunch of them so that at least one of them hit. And it looks like it did a fairly good job. Because there's a there's a decent even distribution here among the uh, among these picks. The lowest is 3. The highest is 11. But here's what you can play along. So we've got, let's see, 11, 18, 19, 20, 21, 27, plus 9. So we got 36 people. Which is not that many, because again, we got like two hundred and some. So if you're a if you're a patron, again, you can win a prize. Just pick one of these if if it hits. But we got Packers win by ten or more. Four people went with that. AJ Dillon scores the first touchdown. Five people went with that. The defense scores a touchdown. Six people went uh, went with that. Aaron Jones runs for hundred yards. Only three. Um, Rogers throws for three hundred yards. Eleven. And then Rashawn records two sacks. Seven people went with that. So and if multiple hit, then I'm just going to use. So, like, if, if Aaron Jones runs for 100 yards and Rashawn gets two sacks, then I'm going to take all the, the seven people here and the three people here, and of those 10, somebody wins. I think at the very least what I'll do is I'll send out, like, a uh, one of my Packers shirts or something. I don't know. Packer net, you know. I'll let you pick one. But again, if you want to get in on it, you can listen to the podcast uh, early and ad-free, because I generally post the podcast. I mean, it won't be like today, because it's going to be live. There's no point in doing it. You can just go listen to it over there. There is the ad-free thing, but uh, oh well. But usually I record the night before, so I'll post it that night, and then you can listen to it that night if you don't want to listen to it tomorrow or want to listen without ads or whatever. But yeah, it's 49ers minus three, and the fact that it's in San Francisco makes it a little bit more, uh, you know, more even. I mean, Vegas is not like over the moon, like the Packers are going to get annihilated like some Packer fans are. But again, I, I'm, I'm, I'm officially to the place now where I've already built the image in my mind of how this is going to go. Again, I think the Packers are better. Overall, but that doesn't necessarily matter when the one thing that the 49ers are better at is the thing they're going to use to dictate this game. So in my mind, I don't expect this to go well, but if it does, that's great. And so there's a little bit of pressure off. Also, on top of that, I've I've already built into my mind that the team seemingly is improving. And I would have loved it if they came out week one just on fire. I would love it if our defense was just, you know, already rocking and rolling. But that doesn't seem to be the case. And it's still possible if the Packers lose this game, that they continue to improve throughout the season, get into the playoffs, and are a team that can win the Super Bowl. So this is not a must-win, although nobody wants the Packers to be 1-2. and It's not a must-win. And I don't want to, you know, I'm not trying to make this doom and gloom like we're going to lose. I'm just telling you my state of mind right now. For the first time in a very long time, I'm comfortable. And and the the best part about this is if the Packers win, it's going to be very exciting. And I kind of want to do more of this. I want to be more in this state of mind because generally, and I think it's sort of a Packer fan thing, we expect a win. And if, if the Packers win, it's like, oh, finally. And you don't even celebrate as much. It's just, oh, that was way too close. I, that was not fun. And if they lose, it's like, this team is trash. I'm so mad. <laughs> just watch the game. And if they lose, eh, it's football. It happens. Doesn't have to mean doom and gloom. It doesn't mean we should have traded Rodgers and this is a waste and we might as well just burn the team and they're never going to win anything. And this is, blah, blah, blah. okay, calm down. Again, we, we only do this to our own team. We only do this to our own team. There's no other team that if you look at and say, if they lose, are they done? If the Cardinals lose to the Jaguars, it's unlikely. But if you saw it, you wouldn't look at that and go, dude, the car, oh my goodness, they're going to be terrible. They're not going to be a playoff team. Everything is ruined for them. You'd look at and go, oh, that's crazy. They lost to the Jaguars. That's nuts. Didn't see that coming. (laughs) If If the Bills lose to Washington, right? It's seven and a half point favorites for Buffalo. Again, the only thought I'd have is, dude, that's crazy, but that's football, man. It happens all the time. Literally happens all the time. If the Patriots lose to the Saints, would not be that surprising. Chiefs lose to the Chargers. The only reason that would take on some significance for me is because the Chiefs used to never lose to anybody. So that one may be a little bit. But again, it's still just football. And nobody, nobody is going to look at that and say the Chiefs are not going to make the playoffs because they lost to the Chargers. Zero people will say that. It's a fluke, right? What if the Bears beat the Browns? Is anybody willing to put $1,000 down that the, the Bears will lose that game? I wouldn't. That's, that's the thing. I don't see a lot of people putting $1,000 down on any of these. 
Why not? Because you understand how football works. You understand how sports in general work. You ever play Streak for the Cash on ESPN? It's free. You just pick games, win or lose, or whatever. And, you know, it would be like 99.9% of people voted for this team because they're way better than the other team. And the 0.01% team ends up winning because that just happens. And after all these masterful bets, the one real obvious one is the one that knocks you out of the streak. So, you know, all I'm saying is don't think less of the Packers than you would of any other team in the same situation because that doesn't make sense. That's the, the thing I'm trying to get through to Mr. Negative's head. He's so mad about our defensive tackles. He's so mad, and a lot of people are. He says, this is a failure of Brian Gutekunst. It's like, okay. It's true that he's a failure in terms of not creating a perfect team, but I don't know that overall, uh, from the standard of what you would expect from a GM, that you would call this a failure. And I asked him, I said, how many teams do you think have a worse defensive line or better defensive line, I guess, depending on what you think is more, than we do? Because you got to remember, Kenny Clark is a part of our defensive line. Everybody wants to just forget that he's even there. We've failed to get defensive tackles. Well, we've got one of the best right now as far as 2021 is concerned. Yeah, but, but the other guys are bad. Oh, well, okay. Because I went through just for fun, and I didn't, I didn't actually add it up, but the vast majority of, of defensive lines, I would say, are worse than the Packers. The vast majority. There's probably half the league doesn't have a Kenny and are, you know, they, they don't have anybody over like a 66 overall, like an average defensive tackle, anywhere along the defensive line, anywhere. It's not like a Kenny and then a bunch of 50-60s guys. It's just 50-60s guys. That's it. And you know what? They win football games. Chiefs are one of those teams. They have nobody. They don't have a defensive tackle. Their defensive tackles suck. They still win. And I don't hear Chiefs fans crying about how their, their GM is a failure. Packer fans do, though, because they love to hate the Packers, and they love to hate their GM, and they love to hate their quarterback, and they love to hate, 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 hate. Greatest fans in football who do nothing but hate their own team. I don't get it. Criticism is fine if it's warranted. Criticism is fine if it's warranted. But again, the way that you judge that is, do you judge other teams as critically as you're judging this team? If not, then it's not warranted. You're just hating your own team. If Brian Gutekunst is a failure, but every other GM who's done a worse job is not a failure... You're not being critical. You're not just being honest while everyone else is being a, a homer. You're just hating your own team for the sake of hating your own team, and I don't, I don't think I understand that. But anyways, we got to take a break. We'll come back, look at the rest of the offense, the defense, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that'll probably be it. We'll see. But we'll take a break, and we'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple, just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop. That's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place. And you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular built for us. Terms apply. Awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. Hey there! Did you know Baker's always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower-than-low prices? 
And when you download the Baker's app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Baker's today. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. This episode is brought to you by Pepsi Wild Cherry. Pepsi Wild Cherry is bursting with delicious cherry flavor and a sweet, crisp taste that gives you more to go wild for. Getting wild may look different these days, but whether it's opting for a solo Friday binge watch or a big night out, everyone can indulge in their wild side with Pepsi Wild Cherry, also available in Zero Sugar. So grab a Pepsi Wild Cherry and get wild. All right, let's get running through this now. Speaking of, let's look at their running backs. Um, So first of all, because it's kind of convoluted in terms of um, actual rushing attempts, the number one runner for the 49ers, because there's a billion running backs, and then you got injuries and guys coming up, blah, blah, blah. Elijah Mitchell's the top guy. Elijah Mitchell is doubtful to play. So Elijah so far, 36 attempts, 146 yards, 4.1 average, one touchdown. He actually only has a 62.9 running grade, so it is what it is. The next biggest runner is actually Jimmy Garoppolo with 10 attempts. After that is Jamichael Hasty, who's run the ball six times so far this season. Jamichael Hasty is out, so we'll continue on. The next biggest runner is Trey Lance, who is a quarterback. He has a 49.1 rushing grade. After that, you get to Raheem Mostert. Raheem has run the ball two times for eight yards with one fumble. (laughs) So, (laughs) um, wait, no, I'm sorry. I was looking at Debo Samuel. Raheem Mostert, two times 20 yards. Debo was two times eight yards and a fumble. So um, after that, you got Kyle Juszczyk, who's ran once for two yards. Trent Cannon ran once for negative one yards. Trey Sermon, once for eight yards. So they've got a bunch of guys who have not touched the ball very much this year. Um, Again, Raheem with two is, is the most, although obviously Raheem has been around for a while. And we also know he's had quite a bit of success last year. Um, 80 overall grade, five yard per carry average. So he's 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 competent. He'll be fine. But um, having kind of a smaller stable is going to be somewhat problematic for a team that wants to mix it up. And each of these guys has their own strengths and weaknesses. And it's nice for a team like the 49ers to be able to mix and match. And, and this is kind of a, a case for Trey Lance a little bit as well. If, if we're kind of short two of our top two running backs, maybe Trey does come in for a little bit and we'll see if we can mix him in. But um, so far, nobody has graded out well at all. Again, the highest grade is Jermichael Hasty, 66. He's out. And then you got Jimmy, who's 64. He's the quarterback. Uh, after that is Trey Sermon, who ran once so far this year. So I don't have a lot of information. There have not been a lot of carries by anybody that's going to be playing in this game. So there's not a lot to to take from this. Looking at receiving grades, um, Debo Samuel's the guy. I mean, he's absolutely the guy, and and we really need Jair, which would make sense because Jair is sort of the outside-inside guy. Um, He's the guy. George Kittle, obviously, is somebody else to pay attention to. There is the question of possibly putting, you know, if, if George Kittle does go in the slot, do you want Kevin King on George Kittle? Do you want Jair on Debo? How exactly is that all going to go? I don't know. Kevin King does make a decent amount of sense because Kittle is a big body tight end, you know. Um, he's got speed as far as tight ends go, and compared to a linebacker, he's he's pretty uh, he's pretty fast. Compared to Kevin King, he's not at all. And at 6'4", 250, again, that's a big dude, but next to Kevin King, 6'3", I mean, 250 is big, but um, the height and speed thing, I don't know. I'm, I, listen, I get it. George Kittle against Kevin King makes everybody want to get sick, but I'm just saying it does neutralize some of what Kittle does very, very well, and that is he's fast for a tight end. And I don't know that a, a big body cornerback is the worst case scenario here. I mean, compared to like Devondre Campbell, I guess. Devondre would match up size wise, but um, 6'4", running a 4'5'2", I don't know how well Campbell can hang with that. I guess he's a 4'5'8 guy. That's not bad. I don't know. Whatever. But as of right now, George Kittle has a 71 overall grade, um, 95 yards, no touchdowns. Again, I fully expect that to pick up, but so far he has not necessarily taken away um, or dominated at anything. Debo is the guy. 20 targets, 15 receptions, 282 yards, and a touchdown. Um, surprise, the, the, the thing that's surprising about the 49ers so far, they're winning through the air. 
right? And I mentioned that. They're, they're one of the top passing teams. They're one of the top passing defenses. They're one of the lower-end running defenses. They're one of the lower-end running teams. This is not what you'd necessarily expect from the 49ers. But again, I would welcome it because they're not winning in the trenches right now. They're winning through the air, and that's exactly where we want them to be. And I don't expect them to want to stay that way. I mean, they're fine with Debo just dominating, and if he can beat our guys, great. But I have a feeling they're going to try to reel that in and get back to what their core is, and that is in the trenches. We win up front, we run the ball, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Otherwise, as far as targets, after that, you got George Kittle with nine. So we dropped from 20 to nine. Again, 95 yards, no touchdowns. Then you have Trent Sherfield, six targets, three receptions, 32 yards, and a touchdown. Um, I mentioned Trent Sherfield. I got a shout out from somebody, not a shout out, but a, a message from somebody. I forget who it was, but he's got a 49ers fan friend that said, Sherfield is basically what we had with Kumaro. He's a guy that's a fan favorite. Everybody loves him. Um, He's not super great, but occasionally he pops up with a big play and everyone freaks out. Um, After that, six targets, five receptions for Jermichael Hasty, 36 yards. Kyle Juszczyk is actually grading out terribly, which is great news for us because he's a pretty potent weapon. Four targets, three receptions, 22 yards. Mohamed Sanu, apparently still around in the NFL, two targets, one reception, seven yards. Then you got Elijah Mitchell, Juwan Jennings, and Brandon Ayuk, who, again, was a pretty serious weapon for them at one point, but is just really struggling right now. And again, this is all positive. They have a mediocre offensive line. They have subpar running backs, and they have one wide receiver right now, and George Kittle. This should not be overly devastating. Anyways, let's flip over to the defense really quick. We kind of went over some of this already, but let's go ahead and do it again very quickly. Um, along the, how should I sort this? Along the defensive line, their top guy right now is DJ Jones along with Kentavious Street. DJ Jones is a very good run defender, which is again, problematic because they got a bunch of good pass rushers. But outside of that, um, DJ Jones has an 81 overall grade. Uh, Kentavious Street, 57 overall. He's got six pressures. So he's more of a pass rusher. And although he's not grading out super well because he's a terrible run defender, solid pass rusher. After that, you've got Kevin Givens, terrible run defender, um, not super good pass rusher either. Then you have Javon Kinlaw, who I believe is a first-round pick for them. Um, He's got a 50 overall grade, not very good against the run, not a good pass rusher, just not a good pick in general. It's another guy. He reminded me of Ed Oliver, where I I think I liked him a little more than Oliver, but I just, I didn't get it. I didn't really understand the Kinlaw love. Um, Then finally, Zach Kerr is another rotational guy that has no impact on this game whatsoever. Um, Terrible run defense, not a good pass rusher. Off the edge, though, is where it starts to get scary. Obviously, uh, their top guy with 99 snaps already this season, Eric Armstead, um, 81.3 overall grade, 15 pressures on 69 pass rush attempts, which is just absolutely stupid. He doesn't have any sacks, but again, um, he is unbelievably disruptive. After that, Nick Bosa, 95 snaps, um, eight pressures on 66 attempts, obviously is pretty dominant. He's already got three sacks on the season. He's only got a 64 run defense grade, which is fantastic. I don't expect that to stay that way. I'm sure he's very good at it, but so far this year he hasn't been, which coupled with everything else is pretty solid. Eric Armstead also not very good run defense grade, only a 66. So really it's just the one guy, DJ Jones. I'm hopeful that we can utilize that to our advantage. I doubt that we can. But again, if you're a good football team with good running backs and a solid offensive line that really prides themselves on their ability to run the ball, I expect you to be able to push these guys around. We'll see what happens. A couple other rotational guys off the edge. Uh, Samson Ibukam, who's been out there quite a bit, not very good at anything. He's got one pressure on 41 attempts, which is terrible. Also not good against the run. After that, they've got Arden Key, who I'm pretty sure was a uh, Raider. Um, 70 run defense, 60 pass rush. He's got three, uh, pressures on 41 attempts. So he's not a very good pass rusher, but he's do- doing a decent job as a run defender. One of the better ones on the team. And then finally you got D Ford who was a prized possession, this, that, or the other, but uh, the run defense is terrible, but still as a pass rusher, again, like everybody else, seven pressures on 42 attempts, which is very high. So all these guys off the edge are just dominant right now. They're just absolute freaks. Fortunately, I don't think they run a lot of NASCAR, which is the old Dom Capers thing where you just take four edge rushers, put their hand in the dirt on the ground and just let them run out. I don't think they do that a lot. I don't know. But these guys are just, they're just beating everybody in a in an unbelievable kind of way. And again, Detroit doesn't have a terrible offensive line. The Eagles, I don't think, have a terrible offensive line. I don't even know anymore. It's been a while. They used to have a dominant offensive line. I don't even know who's left over there, and I'm not going to look at it. But they haven't been going up against scrubs necessarily. This is not, uh, you know whatever. Uh, Linebackers, 
obviously, Fred Warner is the guy everybody knows, everybody loves. I think uh, Roger said he's the best in football right now. He's only got a 62 overall grade, a little bit of a slow start, but still in coverage, 70.7. So he's getting off to a good start as far as coverage is concerned. Um, he does have one pressure. He's been brought six times, so that's fine. They don't do it a ton, but it's enough. Uh, 10 targets, eight receptions, 80 yards, and a pass breakup so far through the air. So he's still doing that. Um, other linebackers, though, uh, the, the guy that's next to him, Aziz al Shair, 26 run defense grade, 54 pass rush, 60 coverage. He's bad at everything. Again, I get that Fred's good. What about the other guy? Can we pick on him at all? Again, on some level, the Packers have to learn how to attack weaknesses and not just try to stop their strengths from it. I mean, other teams use their strengths to dictate those. Well, we can't because they have Fred. Well, they also got Aziz. Do you want to pick on him at all? Why do we always have our weaknesses picked on? Why can't we pick on somebody else's weaknesses? I just, I don't, I don't know why this isn't a two-way street. Otherwise, they got Dre Greenlaw and Marcel Harris at linebacker. Those guys don't play very much. Um, at cornerback, their CB1 is Diamadore Lenoir, who I feel like was like an undrafted free agent or something crazy. He's played the most. Now he's a fifth-round pick out of Oregon. Um, this past year, and he's already had more snaps than everybody else on this team, which is pretty staggering that they got a fifth-round pick at corner, and that's kind of the state of their uh, their group right now. Uh, 146 snaps. He has been targeted, if I could find it here, 14 times, five receptions for 114 yards. He did have one pass breakup. The only reason his grade isn't lower, uh, but that's pretty devastating in two games to give up 114 yards. Again, he's a fifth-round pick. What do you expect? After that, the other guy that's outside is uh, veteran Kwan Williams. Um, he's been in the league for quite a while. His, he's had one good year since 2018, basically. Um, five targets, two receptions, 37 yards. He's got a 56 overall grade, 53 coverage. So again, for the third year in a row, they don't have corners. Um, after that, uh, they got Jason Verrett, 67 overall, 64 coverage. Um, after that is Josh Norman, 47 overall grade, 42.9 coverage grade. He's been terrible. And then Dante Johnson, uh, 31 snaps, basically just average across the board, hasn't really done anything. So they don't have corners. This is, I mean, this, this feels very reminiscent of the Saints. Corners are terrible. They got one good linebacker. Um, they got pass rushers, but the defensive line isn't super great. I mean, this defensive line isn't as bad as the Saints, but it just feels very reminiscent. And then you come over to the Saints. It's the same guys that they've had forever. Jimmy Ward and Jaquiski Tart are their top two guys. Uh, both of them average 69 and 67. Coverage grades are 65 and 62. They've got a couple other guys. Uh, Talanoa Hofunga played 22 snaps, doesn't play very much. And then uh, Tavon Wilson, 19 snaps. So it's g- generally going to be these two guys getting all the reps. And they're average. Again, very similar to the Saints. This is the Saints all over again. Good pass rushers. Defensive line is meh. One really good linebacker. The rest of the linebackers are trash. Corners are trash. Safeties are mediocre. It's the Saints. It's Saints point part two. Can we possibly do better this time? That'd be great. I guess we'll find out. But I got to get out of here. I was going to talk a little college football, but that's fine. We're, we're out of time. You folks have yourselves a fantastical day. I will talk to you tomorrow. Probably do some live streaming tomorrow also. So be on alert for that. But I'll talk to you then. Have a good one. Bye-bye.